Well, good evening, everyone. Hello. I'm Helen O'Sullivan, Pro Vice Chancellor for Education here at Keele, and it's my pleasure to welcome everyone to the Grand Challenge Lectures here in the Institute of Liberal Arts and Sciences. The theme of Grand Challenges is at the heart of the Institute's programme and the shared core of our Liberal Arts and Natural Sciences degrees. The lectures offer a distinctive range of interdisciplinary perspectives on pr pressing societal issues and questions. And our speaker this evening is Dr Joanna Bryson from the University of Bath. Just a brief interlude into housekeeping. The loos, if you haven't found them, are out in the um, reception area. And I think the nearest fire exit is there, and there's one there. And our muster point is in the Italian garden, so in the dark... Good luck finding those. So, anyway, Joanna is a reader at the University of Bath and an affiliate at Princeton Centre for Information Technology Policy. At Bath, she founded the Artificial Intelligence Research Group and heads their Artificial Models of Natural Intelligence. Her first degree is in Behavioural Sciences from Chicago, and she also holds an MSc in Artificial Intelligence and an MPhil in Psychology from Edinburgh, and a PhD in Artificial Intelligence from MIT. Bringing all of these together, her work approaches artificial intelligence from the perspective and for the purpose of understanding human behaviour. Before taking up her academic career, she gained professional research experience from Oxford, Harvard and Lego and technical experience in Chicago's financial industries. Since 1996, Joanna has been working in AI ethics and helped author the UK Research Council's Principles of Robotics in 2010. In the last two years, she's worked with the Swiss National Science Foundation and the Canadian Institute for Advanced Research on researching the impact of AI on society the Red Cross on autonomous weapons, Chatham House on the impact of AI on the nuclear threat, and the British Parliament and the British Financial Conduct Authority, the European Parliament and Commission, the Council of Europe and the OECD regarding the regulation of AI, particularly in the area of economics. In much of her work, Joanne tackles the core question, what kind of things should we worry about in relation to AI? And in her talk tonight, she will address the role of AI in the dual challenges of sustainability and inequality and how this, this might be managed for society. Joanna, thank you for coming to Keele and we invite you to give us your lecture, What is the Role of People in an Age of Intelligent Machines? So uh, there's something I should warn you, which is that I thought this was an hour talk with a half hour question. So I, I'm going to try to go a little fast, but feel free. I hope you can all stay. If you can't, I'll stay. I understand. <laughs> um, right. I'm, I'm going to go to this. All right. Here we go. So um, are machines intelligent now? Is this already the age of intelligent machines? What am I actually asking here? Right. Um, what is the role of people without intelligent machines? This is actually a super hard problem already. What, what does that even mean? Right? Good thing we're in an uh, interdisciplinary liberal arts place, so we can talk about that. Um, and, but I'm not going to talk about those two that much, actually. The first thing I'm going to talk about is who gets to decide. <laughs> right? So, meaning. How do we know whether or not we already have intelligent machines? Well, actually, this is... There's a lot of people who want to uh, um, make certain kinds of points that will tell you we can't possibly have artificial intelligence because we don't even know what intelligent means. All right? Well, actually, what is, what, definitions are things that we use to communicate. And maybe part of the problem here is the mutually agreed part. right? But it's actually not that hard for us to come up with something. There's, uh, you know, originally we didn't have dictionaries that we came, came up with the definitions. We came up with a way to use a word. And the meaning of the word changes over time, right? So, yeah. I just, I'm sorry, this is the first time I gave this talk because I'm really excited about this. But I'm, I'm still slightly not sure the best way to talk about this. There's two different ways that um, meaning changes. Some of it is that I hear you say something, and I try to understand you, and I sort of make a mistake, but it might be a good mistake if it actually makes the word a little bit more useful for me. 
And then I use the word the way I understand. And then you start uh, imitating me. Or maybe you just never understand me, but my kids understand me or something like that. And over time, uh, the language changes in a way that's useful. But sometimes we actually deliberately do something, which I'm going to do in a slide, and say, this is how I'm going to use the word right now. And just so when you are trying to talk to me about it, just so you understand what I'm making my claims about, that's what I'm going to do. Okay? Now, the reason I'm bringing all this up is I want to, as I just sort of said, there, I want to emphasize the fact that there's a lot of, there's two different processes that happen all the time, even for humans, right? A lot of it is implicit. We do things unconsciously. We're learning machines, and we're cultural, and we're social machines. So there's a lot of things we do without ever intending to. And then there's a lot of things that we really do deliberately. You know, we're conscious of, we're responsible for, that we want to change, right? And it's a combination of these two processes. So that's going to be sort of a theme running through tonight's talk that isn't going to get wrapped up at the end, sorry. <laughs> but it's more towards the beginning. But... This is, oh wow, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm getting slightly cut off the side there. It says, AI trained on human languages replicates our implicit biases. And that is a paper that came out in Science. Did you guys hear about this? It came out like two years ago. All right. The idea here is, first of all, you have to understand implicit bias. So implicit bias is not, you know, you can have explicit bias where you say, oh, I don't think people that are different than me are as good as I am, Right. But implicit bias is you could be really nice. You could say, oh, I, I think everybody's the same. And you can behave like that, too. When you get a choice and someone says, who do you want to work with? You, you work with anyone, right? But at the implicit level, <laughs> evil scientists take you into their labs and they make you push, push keys to say what's... Um, well, this is the task. Here, I'll show you. The task is I have a bunch of women's names and I have a bunch of words that are associated with families, like homes and children. And I have a bunch of males' names. And I have a bunch of words that are associated with, uh, with careers, like corporation, salary, stuff like that. And so you can give them two different tasks. One is that in, in both of these, we're going to see how fast can you push the key. All right? And one is try to match up um, the women's names with family words and the men's names with career words. Or the other task is try to match up the men's names with career words and the female's names with, um, sorry, with, with career words and these with the family words, right? Now, if the world was totally fair and if, you know, your unconscious mind was totally fair, those would both be equally easy so you could both do them equally fast. But in fact, humans find it a lot easier to match up women in, in homes um, and and men in careers than the other way around. Okay, and this is, this is found you know, across people again. Um, like I said, there's also science showing that these implicit biases are not correlated with explicit biases that are observed in people's chosen behavior. Okay, but they're ubiquitous. What we showed was that if you train artificial intelligence in the way that we usually do, so the same thing that makes you know, search engines work, in the meanings of words, just by reading words off of the internet, just an ordinary language. We used the whole internet for one of them, and we also used newspaper articles for the other. So we had two different searches. We were able to match up every single implicit bias that had been published by the, by the psychologists. Right? So some people said that meant that we showed that AI uh, was racist and sexist. But really what it showed was that that stuff was embedded in our language. It was about us. And that AI isn't, some people thought, think AI is going to magically improve things. It's, it's like, uh, you know, it, it hasn't uh, eaten from the tree or something. It's going to be fine. But it's not. It's not going to magically fix things. It comes out of our culture. All right. That would have been freaky enough. But one of my co-authors was uh, up for ten years, so he was a little nervous about all this. So I'm coming over here now. So those same uh, the bits of AI, they're called word embeddings. They're representations of each of these words, and you're just looking to see which one's closer. Those same ones that came up with these sexist results also came up with this axis here, the y-axis of this graph. And these little dots are the names of jobs that you can have. And what this is on the bottom is in America in 2015, and we did this paper, we did the work in 2016, the, um, 
what proportion of people who held these jobs were women. So uh, doctors are around here, nurses are up here, programmers are down here, unfortunately. That didn't used to be true. That was one of the things that shocked me the most about this paper. When I was a programmer, there were more women programmers than there are now. But anyway, what you see is that it's pretty well correlated, right? So one of the disturbing things here is that this shows us that our implicit biases are also correlated to reality in some ways. There, there is something going on there. And I think that what, what that shows us is that our implicit behavior is not our ideal, right? It's sort of like a way that our intelligence bootstraps by kind of looking around and seeing what happened in the past. Our ideals are the things that we put in our explicit, in our consciousness. They're things that we negotiate. They're things we're trying to go towards. So it's very important to understand the difference between explicit and conscious things that we try to do and implicit things that, that we don't even understand that we do. Maybe we don't even notice. All right? And it's also important to understand that you, you, even though you explicitly program AI, if you use machine learning, you might pick up these implicit kinds of associations. So far, so good? All right. Okay. No, no. Okay. All right. So now how are we going to define intelligence? I'm going to do it the old-fashioned way. We could do it that way, actually. We could go look and see what words are most similar to it. But I'm going to look it up in the dictionary. And of all these dictionary definitions, the one that I learned both as, I should say this, um, this is from 1883. <laughs> it's a, it's a, um, it was a, a, a monograph on a, an, art, an animal intelligence. And it says that an animal's capacity to adjust its behavior in accordance with changing conditions. In other words, the capacity to take advantage of opportunities and to avoid threats. Right? That, that's the basic uh, definition I'm going to use. This is what I was taught as a, basically a psychology major. I, I was a liberal artist of behavioral science at Chicago in the, in the 80s. Um, and it's also what I was taught when I got to Edinburgh and did my MSc. Okay? So this is actually a definition that people have known for a century. So don't let people say, oh, we don't know what intelligence is. That's a perfectly good definition. All right? So by this definition, yes, we have AI. We have machines. In fact, um, it's been argued since the 60s. Thermostats are a kind of AI. They, they recognize when it gets warm or cold, and they, change, they turn you know, the heating and the air conditioning on and off. Right? Not particularly threatening. All right. So if the intelligence is the capacity to do the right thing at the right time, okay, that, this is the way I normally talk about it. It's, it's, a, it's actually a form of computation. You're moving from perception to action. All right? So that's a physical process. Artificial intelligence is just intelligence in something that we've built. And if we're getting down to trying to understand about accountability and responsibility for AI, that really matters. Right? I don't think there's anything about the fact that a machine is intelligent or a product is intelligent that changes the responsibility for having developed or used or bought that product, right? Some people think there is, but, but I think I'm going to try to persuade you that there isn't. Now, I just told you something. I'm trying to, I told you some facts, and I made some recommendations, and I want to be very clear about this, all right? Again, hey, we're interdisciplinary, so we can do this. Let's, let's mention Kant. There's some things that are essentially true, right? They're, they're, they're sort of true by their nature of the concept of the thing, right? But science is totally not like that, right? We don't need science to figure this out. This is math, or maybe it's not even math. I, I don't want to argue with mathematicians about what's math, right? So um, science is about dealing with things we're not sure about. And let, let me give you a basic understanding of what's wrong with this. I'm calling it the map of Kiel problem. It's actually called the map of Germany problem, but, but I want it to localize. Okay, so here's a map of Kiel. Is it right? Okay. Well, it doesn't, it, doesn't, it doesn't show me where we are. It certainly doesn't show me where my keys are, right? So... The map of Kiel problem is this. The perfect map of Kiel would be the same size as Kiel, right? You can't get all the information. So the idea is, and well, this is another way of phrasing the idea, the idea. A, a statistician named Bach said, all models are wrong, but some are useful, all right? So basically, science is always at least a little wrong, 
Because it's not just the world. The world is the perfect knowledge, like 2 plus 2 equals 4. It's, it's an abstraction over the world. All right? So science has two different kinds of things, data and theories. And theories are basically the, the current best available map. All right? Policy, which is what we were just talking about when you're trying to do governance, isn't like either of these. All right? So policy has scientific predictions. We use those. We know what might happen. <laughs> we don't know for sure, because like I said, science isn't certain. Um, we have desired outcomes, and then we have a bunch of trade-offs. And we have to somehow make that all come together. All right? So to make this a little clearer, and I'm going to use these terms again as I start talking about AI some more, um, what science does is descriptive. It's trying to come up with a way of describing the world that's useful so that we can make generalizations and predictions and things like that. Okay? What policy does is normative. It's trying, it's trying to make a recommendation. We're trying to find a way to decide how we should be. And that goes back to that explicit thing, right? We're trying to neg negotiate a new way to do good stuff. Is this making sense so far? All right. All right, so did you guys see this paper? This one's even more recent than mine. It's not mine. I'm not on it. This is this paper about um, whether a driverless car should run over, like, you know, two women, one man, or, or, or a dog, right? And there's, like, multiple things. You would come up with all these different experiments, and then you'd have people say, which one should I hit? In this case, this is from the paper, the picture in the paper itself. The question is, do we hit uh, um, three elderly people, or do we allow one of the passengers in the car to die? Oh, all the passengers in the car to die. Okay, so there's three people in the car. But there was also versions with like different kinds of, you know, people with different kinds of status down here in the road. All right. So one thing that drove me crazy about the way this... So did you guys hear about this paper? Yeah. One of the things that drove me crazy about it was people said, we're learning about, um, you know, morality for artificial intelligence. It's like, no, we aren't learning about that at all. This isn't normative. This is descriptive. Look. What they did was they went out and said, what do people do? And they showed that people did different things in the different parts of the world. That's really interesting. That's science. That's n that in no way tells us what we should do. It only tells us that if we did do things, people in these different parts of the world would respond differently, right? So, that, that's, um, so that's the difference between normative and descriptive, and I think it's an important thing to be clear about. Okay. We're trying to talk about human roles, too, right? What are roles? So, again, just to go to the dictionary, it's a function assumed or part played by a person or a thing in a particular situation. I didn't make that up. That was the Apple thing. It just happened to say, okay, it could be the robot, it could be a person, it could be the table, right? So, I'm going to assume for the rest of the talk that both functions and situations are basically normative, there's something that we, can, we co-construct as a society. Right? Now, some of you might feel very strongly that individuals have to de, uh, uh, define their own functions, that this is something an individual should do. But I'm not working on that level of abstraction. I'm, gonna, I'm talking about what we do as a group. Okay. So this implies, if it's normative, that it's subject to change. We can't do anything, but we can do quite a lot of different things, so we've got to pick some. All right? So, so there isn't going to be a simple answer. This isn't descriptive. It is normative. We have to think about where do we want to go and what do we want to do. All right. So the question is, how is our role going to change when we introduce intelligent machines? All right. If that's the question, then that is less, um, less normative and more descriptive. We can now say that given the kinds of things that we want to do, or what are we doing now, how could it be when we introduce the intelligent machine? How would that change what we try to do? Okay, so that's the question that I will come back to at the end of the talk. All right? Okay, well, one basic thing we are is alive. Now, some people, uh, if, you've, if you've read my uh, AI ethics before, some people that think I have an unnatural uh, prejudice towards living things and away from robots. But I, I'm just being descriptive now, trust me, okay? All right, so here's some things that are alive, right? And when things are alive, one of the ways you characterize life is persistence, actually. Again, if you look up the technical definition, all right, 
and oops, that was a little bit like, <laughs> I was at the, the, with the, with the, the, the click and the auto, anyway. Uh, so there's two different ways to persist. One is the individual organism survives, and the other is reproduction, that you have children. And then you don't actually yourself persist, but something of your essence per, uh, uh, persists. All right. So whenever you have two possible ways to do something, you get a bunch of trade-offs. And in nature, we see this, right? There's some species that have you know, thousands and millions of, of offspring and then die in a day. And there's some species like us that have relatively few offspring and live really quite a long time. And actually, there's like trees and things that do both, right? You can find all different kinds of combinations. This is really interesting, because where you have trade-offs, you have diversity. And where you have diversity, you have a capacity for change. This is actually Fisher's fundamental theorem. So it's important that we maintain diversity, and it's cool that we have trade-offs. Anyway, I just always say that. It's not much to do with the topic. <laughs> we'll come back to it. Anyway, so back to... Uh, the two different things we can do, since one of them is reproduction, um, we're necessarily social. There's, there's, there's parents and children, you've already got at least two agents, right? And sociality is a fundamental thing about, about humans. Come on, build. Oh, there we go. So there's two forms of, of sociality, uh, competition and cooperation, right? That basically, that's two ways to think about it. Now, if you've only read the title of The Selfish Gene, you might think nature is entirely about um, competition, right? Survival of the fittest. But in fact, what's really interesting, there, there's like a book behind the title. I, I have a paper like this too. The whole book is saying, well, given that genes are selfish, why is it that there's no single gene organisms, right? Everything in the world, everything in nature, there's some chairs down here, you guys. <laughs> Come on. The, um, everything in nature is cooperating. It's all about genes cooperating. There's animals that are kind of cooperating when they, when they come together and create things. I'll show, you, I'll show you in a second. These guys, these, these are amoeba, right? Single cell. So lots of genes, but only one cell. Actually, the vast majority of life is single cell, right? So they swim around and they do their amoeba things. They're not terribly intelligent, but they can sense and react to their environment. Um, but one of the things that happens to them sometimes if things are going badly is they get stressed, right? And if these guys are stressed, one of the things they do is then they pull together and, the, and, and it looks like a slug and it moves around like a slug, but there's no, there's no nervous system or anything. They just uh, communicate with chemicals and the ones on the front even sort of become eyes. They look for where the light is and they direct it to go forward. All right, this is called a slime mold. And then... If they find a place that looks like the right kind of place, somehow, they turn into kind of this tree thing, and then the ones at the very top get to turn into spores, and they fly away, and they make more amoebas. All right? So that's kind of cool. Nature is wild and crazy. And you should see these. Go, go look at them on, on uh, YouTube. They, they, like, pulsate, and they're really weird things in jungles. But what biologists worry about a lot is what about these guys? Remember, they used to have independent lives and now they've just turned into something that's getting thrown away. They're never going to have children. Why would they do that? Right? Well, we've actually known the answer to this since 1964. And, and the, the problems people have getting their heads around cooperation, even though we know basic things, is similar, I think, to the problems we have getting our heads around AI. If it comes too close to what we think is essentially human, that we kind of push back, even if the science is there. All right? So all this is saying is that I'm willing to pay a cost if the benefit that I generate for somebody else is if, well, not just, there's not just one other person. So I'm paying a cost, but there might be a lot of other people. That's what this means. You know, so over all the different people that I affect, how much benefit do they get, and how related are they to me? All right? And if you, and so it could be me, myself, right? So obviously then I pay the cost. But if this sums up, then, then evolution can find the solution, okay? Evolution will be able to, to uh, support organisms that do this kind of thing. So you even get, you know, salmonella. This is nasty, right? Salmonella, this, this disease, when it, again, when it's stressed and it needs to find a new food source, it attacks your stomach. And it does that by uh, blowing itself up. 
the cells, some of the cells blow themselves up, and the other cells get to eat because actually they're practically clones of each other. They're single cell organisms, so the relatedness is really high. So it's pretty easy to, to convince, you know, for evolution to convince the cells to do that. So not magic and not that complicated and known since 1964, right? So when do we cooperate? So there's fundamentally, as, as was mentioned in my introduction, there's two problems. One is sustainability and one is inequality. Okay? So sustainability is basically how big can we make the pie? That's the one way to think about it. And inequality is basically how big of a slice does everyone get? It may not be the same size. All right? So cooperation grows the pie and competition grows the slice. All right? And we cooperate if we can find a way to grow the pie and that that seems to be better in some kind of cost-benefit uh, ratio than competing over a slice, basically, right? And you can see that this is, you could take this to say, when do we compete? So when people don't believe that there's a way to grow the pie anymore, they're much more likely to compete. Okay. So this is some work done by my colleagues. Again, this isn't my work. And this is all humans, no AI here. These are cities, and I'm sorry they're kind of truncated, but these are cities of the world that they went out and they ran experiments to see uh, how people treated people. Well, actually, they were trying to see how well they could cooperate. But this is sort of a, a, a side effect of that study. One of the things they let little groups of people that were trying to cooperate together do, um, so they, they kept the people who were working together anonymous. So they couldn't just go and buy them a beer afterwards or something, right? So... They, they, they don't know who they're playing with, and they're trying to decide whether to cooperate. And, um, and they don't cooperate that well. They, they sort of cooperate, okay. But then you let them punish each other, okay? So you say, you, if you pay one pound, then I'm going to take three pounds away from anyone else you choose. Okay. So originally, these experiments were done in Zurich, and they, they published all these big papers that got into nature saying, Oh, look, this explains human cooperation because people punish those who give less than they do. They'll, they'll spend a lot of money punishing those who give less than they do. But uh, this guy here, Benedict Herman, said, I don't believe Russians would do that because <laughs> he worked in Russia and he thought the Russians let people get away with things. He was wrong. Actually, it's pretty common that uh, this, this dark green you see is common across all the different cities. But he was kind of right. There was something going different in the former Soviet Union, and also uh, sort of the former Ottoman Empire. And what that is, is here's people that are punishing people that are giving them money. That's what the red is. Okay? And that's, there's a huge variation in how much of that happens. This is people that are punishing people that gave the same amount of money they did. All right? So you see a couple of uh, places where it doesn't seem what matters. They just, they just punish you a lot. Okay, what's going on? Well, one of the things that's going on here is that the, the places at the top, which have hardly any of that antisocial punishment, are the places that are richest. And they're also the places with the highest rule of law. Okay? And those two things tend to correlate too. So it's hard to know the causality. I mean, science is hard. We're still working on this. But it would sort of make sense that you're more likely to think that you're not going to get a benefit if you... Uh, if you uh, share with other people if you're somewhere where, the, where, it's hard to, where it's hard to make money, right? And what we showed, so that, this was not my group, but this is me and some of my uh, some postdocs, actually. Um, looking just at, so the, they ran this game that I just showed you t for 10 rounds, but looking at just rounds two through nine, okay, I, I think I actually builds on this too. The bottom part here, this, this, th these are horrible colors, and I apologize, <laughs> but whatever the heck this color is, um, those are people who never punished anyone. Right? They didn't bother. Um, and these people here, the green, are the ones who only punished those who didn't give as much as they did to the group. All right? And then the top people are actually people who punished everyone. Okay? So these antisocial punishment, it's almost like a side effect. Because there's, only, there's four people in the group, so it's like one in four people are, are not only punishing everyone, but also not giving much to the group. Okay? So I, I think what's going on here is that, as I said, the, the number of, these are, these are probably very competitive people. These are just 
Like, they don't care. They're, in fact, the psychologists have a term for this. They're, they're individualists. They don't care what the other people are doing. And these are people that are group-oriented. They say, hey, you guys, why aren't we all, let's, be, let's act like a group and let's, let's win this game, right? And so what you see is that the proportions of people who are taking the different strategies are changing. And again, this is the old graph turned on its side. So there's more people that are competitive in the places with lower GDP, all right? Okay, that's not, that's not published yet, but that's my guess. All right, so it's, it's not just people that are like this. All right, this is a paper about chimpanzees. Do you remember that Jane Goodall, Jane Goodall showed a chimpanzee war? It was a huge deal, and if you read her biography, people told her not to publish it when she discovered it because it would be bad for humanity to find out that other species had wars. But she thought, if you saw something, if you see something, you should say something. Right? We, we need to understand what's going on. And so... Um, and so she got attacked. People said, well, maybe this is because of, uh, you know, that you've been feeding these chimpanzees and they're acting like humans now. <laughs> right. But anyway, it's now, uh, you know, 2014. It's well understood that you can get this. We're, we're chimpanzees, that we're friends, they're all the same troop, um, can split up and then fight wars. And it happens when there's not enough food, generally speaking. That's the main thing. Um, and, and, and it's interesting because, you know, how we dehumanize in war, they dechimpify in war. So, so these guys, they're, they're all smiling here, but they occasionally have fights too, like over who gets to be the big boss, right? And they can even kill each other. But when those guys kill each other, they kill each other like they kill like something they were hunting. They treat it like a deer. They rip their arms off and stuff like that. These guys would never rip each other's arms off. Okay? So I think humans are more than chimps, though. And one of the ways that we're more than chimps is that Okay, you can have an individual, and these are all androgynous. I'm not trying to do genders here. <laughs> you, have, you have individuals, and if they're lucky, they got a family. Well, they, they definitely have parents. Um, and they definitely have neighbors. We all have uh, geographic neighbors. But we also maybe have people we work with that might be another group. And we can have people that we socialize with. And this is different from any other species. So we know species like those slime molds that'll get together and work as a group sometimes and might pull apart. But we don't have these overlapping, complicated identities that can turn really quickly when someone ch when changes, says, oh, hey, here's a new identity. Here's a thing that we can grab. And then we can change the number of people who are working on a particular problem very quickly. Do you see? So I think this is one of the most essential parts of what's going on with humans. And, again, here's another science paper. Uh, again, not by me. But these guys, using theory, showed us that when you have more communication, you expect to get more coalitions. Why? More cooperation. Because communication basically just increases the chance that we can figure out new ways to cooperate. Remember when I told you it's about if you can see a way that you could grow the pie, then that may be a lot nicer <laughs> and a better thing to do than having to go fight other people that are like yourself. Right? So communication lets you uh, find new ways to cooperate. Or another way to say this, if you're a biologist, is that it increases the group level investment, which implies that you're less likely to be investing at the individual level. All right. So AI facilitates communication. Great, right? Well, except there's all different kinds of things to cooperate about. Right? So um, let's say. Let, let us do just a very basic thing. Let's, let's assume that instead of what I told you before, going all the way from uh, something to action, any part of, of human intelligence will call AI as well. Okay? So anything, if we can make humans more intelligent, if we can perceive or act, right? If you, if you believe that, then every single machine we've ever built has been AI. Right? It's, been, it's, been, it's been advancing human intelligence, especially writing, because that, that increased human memory. So yeah, uh, that should be 12,000 years of AI, sorry. <laughs> so 12,000 years of AI since, since we've had writing. Now, if I'm right, one of the things, have you guys heard about this stuff, superintelligence? There's, there's a, a guy named Nick Bostrom literally wrote the book called Superintelligence, but the term, or at least the concept of the intelligence explosion was started by a guy named I.J. Good. Again, he wrote it back in 1965. These are the years they wrote it. So uh, I.J. Good said that AI would be the last invention we'd ever need. 
And some people are making that sound like some huge, some huge threat, like our, finals, our final invention. But he thought it was great, because then like, the machines will invent stuff for us. right? So anyway, but Bostrom doesn't think it's great either. But anyway, this is a very coherent idea. If you can learn how to learn, then one of the things that you would expect is that you would see an exponential growth, exponential improvement. right? OK, so let's go back to this. I would say the intelligence explosion is us. All right? So this looks like exponential growth, right? Just like it is. This is the number of people on the planet since, uh, since we've had writing. But look at this. This is a log scale over here. This is exponential on exponential. OK? 10,000 years ago, there was around a million, a million people, a million, a million hominids. Up until 10,000 years ago, there were more macaques than there were hominids. All right? The monkeys were winning. They evolved more recently, and they were winning. All right? Although we were doing pretty well. We got onto a lot of continents and things. But you know, boom, this, this is an explosion. All right. Well, one of the things that, uh, that Bostrom talks about, and I.J. Good didn't, was unintended consequences. So a lot of people said, uh, Bostrom, you're a great philosopher, but you don't know much about building software. Um, we, we actually you know, control things. We check things. We, there's this thing called systems engineering that we do to make sure that things work. And so he thought some more. He didn't go start writing software. And he said, look, even if you had a system that did the goals you told it to do, while if you let it figure out its own way to do that, you might have something come out that's not what you expected. So let's think about people. Um, let's assume that uh, the goals of humans are sort of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. All right? Well, there could be unanticipated uh, consequences. Right? So remember I said we, we were doing OK. We, we got all the way to like Australia and the Americas before we had writing. But, but look at this in terms of this is uh, the, the amount. This is our population. And this is the number of megafauna, that means just big animals, <laughs> that, that the number of species that there were um, as, as we uh, came here. And again, um, oh, that, that's not a log scale. OK. But anyway, you, you see what's happening here. Um, I don't think, you know, people talk a lot, and it matters, about global warming. I don't think they talk enough about this. This is XKCD, and it was based on data that's at least 10 years old now. You know, if you think about all the land mammals around now, this is the humans, the dark gray. This is our cows, OK? Basically, all the light gray is stuff we either eat or play with, OK? The green is what was left of wild animals, right? We're just, there's a lot of issues of sustainability we weren't thinking about. So yeah, I would say unanticipated consequence one, sustainability. And of course, two is climate change um, and all the things that come along with that. I don't see this only as a problem. I, it's a problem of inequality. There's some people that have very little left, and so they move. Right? So is all this because of AI? Well, by the definition I gave before with writing, obviously. But if we go back to the normal definitions of AI, where we're talking about with computers, um, then we've had these kinds of problems before. All right? We've been talking about them for centuries, but we've had data for about a century. So I apologize, this is an American graph. That's because America did this really stupid thing in 1913, which was uh, ban alcohol. And when they banned alcohol, they had, to, they had to tax something else, so they taxed income. So we now have a graph of what proportion of income went to the top 1%, so just the top 1% of earners. And that's this dark gray graph. And what you see is that income inequality now is as high as it's been since World War I. Okay? Um, now, what is this gray graph? This is polariz political polarization. And in America, that's pretty easy to measure because there's only two parties. Um, and so uh, you're measuring this by... How, what proportion of bills that get through Congress are, have both parties working together. Okay? So, and this is work by uh, Nolan McCarty. Uh, again, he's got cut off here, but you'll see him on my thank you slide. But, but he was doing it, and before him, his PhD supervisor. So people have known this for decades. 
So economically, we've been here before. And the question is, well, actually, there's a bunch of questions. Let's, let's do the build. So some more whizzy builds. OK. So in the late 19th century, inequality was, was happening too. And it, maybe it was also then because of technology. So one way that you could get inequality or increasing inequality is if you have new ways to make money over a larger space. So let's say that we didn't have huge amounts of nice alcohol here. In fact, it's all disappeared. Um, uh, let's say that we were going to a pub. We wouldn't go to the best pub in Britain. We probably wouldn't even go to the best pub in this county. We would go to something that was both good and nearby, right? But if, if, if you can move, go further, then there's going to be fewer pubs because everybody will try to get to the best pubs nearby. And hardly anyone uses Bing, right? <laughs> so now we've got something at a global level. But the thing that may have changed stuff in the late 19th century may have just been stuff like telegraphs, um, oil, rail. Those were things that made distance matter less. So, and, and distance still matters now, too. I have so many slides. I'm sorry about this, but I have some great slides I I'm not showing you about the, the cost. It still costs a lot to do what Google is doing. They, and and, and you know, even though it's the internet, they're paying a lot for their power bills, for example. But anyway, so we've made distance matter less, and so there's fewer winners. But what's really interesting is that somehow we got it down. What happened? And notice that the political polarization went before the inequality. Well, apparently, um, both in the UK and in the US separately, um, sort of a bunch of the elite uh, coalitioned with the proletariat. In the, in the US, we call that the New Deal, FDR. Right? They just said, we, this was for us, uh, and, and for those British and Americans, it was like one world war and one financial crash was enough. We don't want to lose more stuff. We've realized that the, the battle for being this much richer isn't worth it. We need to somehow make things more stable. All right. Unfortunately, half of Europe had just lost a war and was having wealth extracted from it, and they, they wound up falling into fascism. Right? But in 1945, we signed up to the Bretton Woods stuff, and then globally, we have this period for the OECD. I want to say also, AI is not only a bad thing. Inequality has plummeted globally. In the last 15 years, 4 billion people have been moved out of extreme poverty. I mean, that's amazing, right? And part of that's just getting information. That may be more about mobile phones, but it's a little bit of just knowing what should you grow? What is the weather going to be? What is a fair price for your product? Right? Um, some people think it's mostly what's happening in China and India, but actually this seems to be happening across Africa, across South America too. So a lot of people are, 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 are being helped. But in the OECD, the, the richest countries, we are having this, this uh, spiking inequality. So yeah, it may be now, we know, uh, again, those of you who are historians of, of the 20th century know, uh, and political scientists know that a lot of stuff was done to try to solve these problems. And it may be that every time we have a big technological innovation, we're also going to have to figure out how to do something different with regulation and with governance. All right. So I'm trying to decide. I, I'm supposed to be wrapping up pretty soon, and I've still got a lot of slides left. Not, not tons. We're, we're about two through it. Uh, well, anyway. This is, again, another paper that we haven't got out yet. Oh, there's Nolan again. This is Nolan McCarty, and this is Alex Stewart, who wrote the actual model. But we're trying to understand why inequality and polarization are correlated. Uh, again, that's, we know that they are. We don't know why. This is back to we've got the data. We don't have a theory. And so we have a theory, but we haven't got it published yet. So, but I'll tell you about it anyway. Um, the basic idea is that we've already shown that, uh, or we didn't show. It's been shown in science that when you have a more diverse group, you tend to get a higher payoff you, on average. But what we're assuming is that if you cooperate with a less diverse group, you know, you know what's going to happen. You're more likely to be able to guess what someone who's like you is going to do. But So even though you're not going to do as well, you, you know more likely exactly what's going to happen. All right. So the idea is that um, if the economy is declining, then... There's a, a, then you may not be able to take the risk of working with people that are different from you because you're afraid of not having enough to just be able to be solvent, to stay alive, to keep your company together, whatever. And what's cool is that um, 
we, we, we had this as a hypothesis, but we knew that there was this thing we weren't sure about, which was, well, sometimes in nature, when, there's, when things are really bad, we see big risk-taking. So what's going on there? And what actually happens is that we're right, that there can be a, a situation that uh, as the economy gets worse, that you do wind up working more with your in-group. But if it gets really bad, then you know this isn't going to be good enough, because remember, it's pretty certain. So then it becomes a lot better idea to work with the outgroup again when things are really desperate. So that's when you really need to remember to cooperate. All right. So um, I'm going to skip over that for now. I want to talk about jobs. We are actually getting towards the end now. <laughs> I know that, that, that I've been talking really at a very high level, but let me t bring it down to like actual what happens to ordinary people level. Um, is AI going to take all the jobs away? Well. It, we have more AI than we've ever had, and we have more jobs than we've ever had. So it doesn't seem like AI is taking the jobs away. And something that's not on this slide, but I just want to say it. Let's say we had AI that made teachers twice as good. Okay? Let's just say, you know, somehow we figured out a way to do that. Well, so then either all of our kids could have twice as good of education, or all of our taxpayers could pay for half as many teachers, right? Nothing about AI, that goes again back to the descriptive versus the normative. Nothing about AI decides how we invest to use that technology. It, that's a policy decision. Okay, was that clear? I'm sorry I didn't put that as a graph. There's a bullet here. All right, so it's possible that one of the things that's making inequality go up is the fact that AI makes it easier for people to do things, to acquire skills that we can learn faster. All right? Because then what you lose is you lose something called wage differentiation, right? And again, as far as I understand, I've been talking to some great economists, that's one of the cool things about getting to do all that stuff, was you get to be in the same room with other smart people. <laughs> and, and it seems like people aren't entirely sure about what's going on with this. And this is what I want to do next when we get these other two papers I was talking about published. I hope this summer I'll be working on this. But anyway, let me give you some examples I know. So this came out of David Otter. This was in his paper. He's not the one who figured it out. His, one of his friends in Boston figured it out, but he was the one who wrote the paper faster. <laughs> but anyway, he gets credit, and I, I keep forgetting the guy's name. Ask me if you want, want to know. Anyway, there's more human bank tellers, or at least in 2015 there were, uh, in 2015 than there were before there were automated teller machines. And the reason was there was actually fewer um, bank tellers per branch, but that made branches cheaper, and people like having branches nearby, and so the banks opened more branches, all right? This is, now what I used to do is I would talk about this, and then I'd say, but you know who we've unemployed with AI? Journalists, right? And we didn't unemploy them by replacing them. We unemployed them by taking all the advertising money and giving it to Google and Facebook, right? So this is a provision sentence. But let's go back to this ATM thing. I was talking at the Royal Bank of Scotland, and they said it was fine for me to give this example. Um, they, they were happy to share what they'd learned. <laughs> and one of the things they told me was that, yeah, okay, tellers are actually now a little better paid than they were before, because the really easy jobs are going to the machines, right? But the, part of the reason the branches are so much cheaper is they're smaller, so there's fewer branch managers. And those were the people that were the real savings. It wasn't, it wasn't the fewer tellers. And the branch managers used to be the people, again, they were just people that were from the bank, they did well, they, got, they, they, they sort of won the lottery, they got up. Presumably they were a little better than the other tellers. But then those people were the ones, back to wage differentiation, that if you had some problem with a school or whatever, they might donate the money to the school, right? So you're getting, the wage differentiation is helping you get money back out to where people need it. Here's another example, though, about, about what's happening with employment. Um, uh, Luciana Floridi is a philosopher of in information that's been doing AI ethics recently. And he's going around saying, all oh, this stuff about driverless cars taking jobs is ridiculous. There aren't enough truck drivers. And actually, Uber says this, too. Like, look, the, all the truck drivers are old, and, they, and nobody wants to take their jobs. Well, the reason for that is because the the you get paid 50% less than you did in the 1970s to be a truck driver, okay? Why do you get paid less? Because in, before the 1970s, 
we didn't have this thing called power steering. Remember my definition of AI? <laughs> power steering is taking like this, this turning and then producing the motion. Before that, you had to be this enormous, strong person that would, that would physically steer the car. Not only did you have to physically steer the truck, also you had to be good at reading maps, and also you had to be good at scheduling your time and, and budgeting and everything. Now we have GPS, we have spreadsheets, and we have power steering. Okay? Not anyone can be a truck driver, but a lot more people can. And so that allowed the, the, the wages to come down. So I think fundamentally, the problem isn't um, employment, the problem is wages and redistribution and, and politics. And a lot of people think right now that one of the problems with AI is democracy. I don't, I'm not going to go into the dem democracy thing here unless you ask me to in Q&A. I'm actually going to finish out talking about justice, my <laughs> smaller topic. Um, who is accountable when AI goes wrong? All right. Well, again, this is a normative question going back to the beginning, why I set that up. This is not a descriptive question. We get to make the laws that decide about who's responsible. And so now I'm making a normative recommendation. Only humans can be accountable. Going back to the role of humans, we're the ones who made the justice system, okay? And a lot of justice is about dissuasion. It's about stopping people from doing things, all right? We feel like we've got compensation. I mean, once in a while... You know, you stole something, and then you have to pay a fine to make up for it, right? Once in a while, it's like compensation. But normally, even those fines are bigger than the actual loss, right? It's to, to dissuade people from doing this, um, because you, don't, you have to figure out the proportion, the probability of the person being caught to, to make an, an appropriate level of fine, right? Sometimes somebody uh, is killed. You know, you, if, you're, if your partner is killed, and then they find the murderer, and the murderer goes to jail. You, you can get people on television saying, like, I feel like, you know, I, I feel closure now. I feel like I finally got something back. You didn't get anything back, right? It's nothing. Having someone go to jail is nothing like having a partner, right? So dissuasion is the way law works. And a lot of it, um, and a lot of it basically depends on suffering, things that people don't want to do, right? I've been frankly astounded, uh, speaking of American politics, of uh, you know, some of the people that have been, uh, they, they had been working on things for decades, and then they get threatened with three years in jail, and then they recant entirely. You know, these peop the, the people that are involved in, some, in, uh, like in the Ukraine or whatever. So they were affecting millions of people's lives. They don't want to spend three years away from their family, right? So that kind of sense of uh, suffering, right, is... is the way we've evolved so that we can be social. Remember, that's fundamental to our strategy. But when we're building AI, we don't do that. We build AI in a modular way. So like, imagine I had a robot, and you know, it was just a normal working robot, and then I decided, oh, I know, I'll, I'll add a face recognition system and a timer and a bomb. And if the face recognition system hasn't seen any faces for five minutes, the robot blows up. Okay, so in some ways that's worse than being human, right? Because we, we will survive if five minutes are, are over, right? But everything else in the robot doesn't care. If you don't connect it in, then it won't even know. But it's not going to have this kind of systemic aversion that we have to the, the concept of that, right? So no penalty of law enacted against an artifact, including shell companies. That's what a shell company is, uh, can actually have an impact. Sorry, I should have changed the word there. And this is a paper we had also come out in 2017 that was about this because we were worried because the European Parliament had asked the European Commission to, uh, to enact a law that might make some kinds of AI uh, into legal persons. And we said, no, that would be the, ult the ultimate shell person. The, the ult <laughs> sorry, the ultimate shell company. It would be a way to reward corporations for fully automating their business process, that is, not paying people, um, by capping their liabilities. And we don't want to do that. Why would we want to do that? Okay. So it is perfectly possible to have transparent and accountable AI. And you know, I don't have to show you this slide. I can, I can tell you. Think of the two times that people have been killed by, uh, by driverless cars. You read what happened within the next week. You knew exactly what happened, right? You saw the pictures of, of, of you know, 
what the car had seen, you read about what the developers had been doing, you know, what, and how the car had interpreted what it saw, right? Do we remember this? Yeah, then the Tesla thing, it was like, oh, they knew that, that if a car was stopped on the highway that, the, that it wasn't good with that. They knew that in advance, that's pretty culpable. Right? They, they, but they told people, you should watch out for that. Like, you're gonna notice, like how often have you seen a car? Uh, I mean, a truck stopped on a highway. And the other one, the Uber one, there was a woman, unfortunately it was a homeless woman with, with unusual clothing that was flapping in the wind, who was pushing a bicycle across a highway where the speed limit was 40 miles an hour in the dark at four in the morning, right? And so the first thing the car thought was that it was a piece of paper because of the way the clothes were fluttering. Then it thought it was a person riding a bike because there was a bike. And then half a second before it hit her, it said, oh, it's a person pushing a bicycle. That wasn't enough time. And then it said, oh, the driver better do something. Like, and that certainly wasn't enough time for the driver. All right? But a person could have done that. People kill other people with cars like two million times a year. Right? So that, to me, that was less culpable than the Tesla thing. But anyway, we, we, we all know this. I know it's from a newspaper. I know it's from some big science thing. We all read this in the newspaper. Why? Because the automotive industry uh, makes, holds people accountable already because it's so dangerous. And so there's been good software practices there. All right? So yeah, in the worst case, an AI system is as is, is, is impossible to understand as we are. Right? When we go into a bank and say, are you, is there corruption here? You know, nobody goes and says, can we explain all the, how all the, the synapses of the brain are connected, right? That's what, and, and people say, oh, but you, if we use machine learning, we can't be held to account. It's like, no, that's nuts. We don't care about the weights, and we don't care about the synapses. What we care about is, did you, did, are the accounts right, right? What was the right thing done for the right reason? You might say, oh, but people, we could put on a witness stand, and then we could ask them if there's due diligence. Well, no, we're just guessing based on empathy, why, whether they did the right thing. The best thing is to have a record, a transcript of exactly what they did and why. And you can do that with, with AI. With, 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 you can have, um, whenever you develop software, you can keep track of every line of the program that was changed, why it was changed, who changed it, when they changed it. With machine learning, you could say, what data did we use? Right? Where did it come from? How did we train it? When did we think we were done? You know, should we release it? And then after the system is live, you go ahead and you log the system performance. That's, what, that's why you can see what the car saw. Because the car is keeping track of what it saw. It has a disk. It's remembering that in some sense. Okay? So it's perfectly possible to keep ordinary accountability through AI. It's, I'm not saying that every AI system, we can know what, what, well, how it works or what it's doing. I'm saying that we ought to insist that if somebody is putting a commercial system out there, that they better do this. All right? So this is good practice. And if you don't do good practice, then you should be held accountable for the damage you've done. And I hope we're going to have some really big cases of that come out in 2019 that will make people that drop out of Harvard think twice about not thinking about ethics. Right? You know, not, you don't have to have had a massive life experience. Okay, so what makes us responsible? Um, I'm going to skip this because we're almost done. Um, is anyone here who thinks that the robots deserve to be responsible? Okay, I'm going to skip this one. Sorry. <laughs> so humans choose to build, own, and operate AI, right? And if they can't prove that they did so responsibly, then I think we should hold the humans accountable. All right? That's the thing that's going to motivate them to do the stuff I just talked about. So, and if you are worried about the robots' phenomenological experiences, um, then maybe you should worry about cows. <laughs> okay? Because we're never going to build something out of chips and wires that's going to be, have as much of the same experience as the cows. I, I, my, I have relatives in Stafford, and I, you know, I know what the cows sound like when, they're, when the calves are taken away from them. You know? that, it's not, that's, we're never going to build something that has that much commonality to our own experience. right? So are any of these things human? I actually was thinking about it, that the dog may be more like a human in some ways than the chimpanzees are, in fact, we know that, that dogs are more likely to trust you if you point at stuff, right? So, so dogs and humans have, have sort of worked out this whole trust thing together for 10,000 years, right? But, you know, what about this baby? I, arguably, those, those adult chimpanzees and the dog um, would be more human-like than the baby, even though it's our species. I mean, here's something. 
So this was uh, a, a chimpanzee that unfortunately died. It had a medical condition. And the people, it was, it was a, sort of a natural thing. It was in Africa, but it was, um, they were trying to save it and they couldn't. And they made the decision to make sure that the other chimpanzees knew what had happened. Right? Now, I don't know what they're thinking. We can't know what they're thinking, but we can tell that they cared. They, they want to know what's going on at least. Right? And I don't think the baby would have had that same understanding. Right? So, I think that um, with respect to AI, we're obliged to build AI, we're not obliged to, because those kinds of obligations are hard enough as it is. There's no reason that we should even want to, even if we could, build AI with those kinds of problems. So what is the role of humans in an age of intelligent machines? I think it's the same as ever. Right? We have obligations to ourselves. You, know, you have to have your own oxygen mask on before you can help others, otherwise you just die. Right? But also to our families and our neighbors. Um, but the, it is different. As we get more technology, <laughs> we have obligations that are extending with our power. That's going back to the sustainability question. Right? So we have obligations to our planet, to our climate, managing transnational corporations who know more about what we do than we do. <laughs> right? These are all new problems we have to fix. But at the center, I think it's us, and I think it's hard set of problems. And I think if any of you don't already have PhDs and want one, please apply to Bath. <laughs> okay, so thanks to my uh, collaborators and you for all this time. <laughs>